Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome back to the only non-true crime show on YouTube that obsessively talks about murder, that time on Murder, She Wrote. Today we're zipping forward into the later seasons, season 9 to be exact, because I find that these episodes hit all the right campy notes for me. At this point in the show, Jessica is a very successful murder mystery author and has an apartment in New York City, and that is where this plot takes place. Get ready for... The Dead File. Aw, look, it's Jessica as a comic book fox. This episode is what the youngins call stacked with well-known names, including, but not limited to, Harvey Firestein, George Firth, John Polito, and Patrick McNee. We begin our episode with a spooky scene of someone slowly walking into a quirky apartment, opening a suspicious looking box, then putting on medical gloves for five minutes straight. Ah yes, the rare self-proctology exam. While it may seem like this is leading up to something nefarious, we soon figure out that this is a comic book artist just doing some late-night lettering on this Jessica Fletcher inspired strip. He's inking that good old JB Fletcher saying, chicken. Jessica is returning from a vacation in Italy. As she enters her apartment with the bellboy, he tells her how amusing he finds the Fox character. She has no idea what he's talking about, so he shows her the latest newspaper. You are the Fox, ain't you? Well, I have been known to be pretty foxy in my day. In France, she would be called La Renard and she would be hunted with only her cunning to protect her. We cut to an extremely artsy looking loft that looks like it came straight from the movie toys. It is lived in by comic strip writer Stan Hatter. A woman's voice sounds off from the answering machine and he reacts with mild annoyance. They don't call them ex-wives for nothing. Because I am extremely gay. Ex, extre, extremely. Stan and his assistant Teddy work on Hatterville, a comic about a town full of animals where Jessica Fox solves crime. They are being followed by this Alan Arkin impersonator, and in the next scene we realize he's being sent to follow him by another comic strip writer, Dayton Whiting. Whiting sent this guy there to find potential blackmail on Hatter, and what is this place? Where is this place? This old lady character is going to show up in my nightmares. Also, I didn't realize comic strip writers were so hostile. Can you imagine Charles Schultz trying to blackmail Jim Davis? I hate Mondays indeed. Mr. Bozell, the man trying to dig up dirt on Hatter, hasn't found anything of consequence yet, so Whiting tells him to create something. Why else would I have hired you? Because I'm so calm. Whiting then goes back to completing his strip called Biff Banyan, which sounds like a Back to the Future villain. Meanwhile, Jessica is not happy with her likeness showing up in the comics. She's visited by Lieutenant D. Martini. Wait, your name is D. Martini, Like the drink? Who accuses her of saying unsavory things about him in the form of a cute cartoon fox. Jess is not having it. In the comic, Jessica Fox accuses the rodent officer of evidence theft, which happens to be based on one of D. Martini's real drug cases. He was accused of stealing cocaine from an evidence locker. He's been fighting the accusations for years and tells Jess the comic strip is incriminating. She says she doesn't know anything about the comic and suggests he talk to the author, which makes the most sense, and I have no idea why he went to Jess in the first place who has nothing to do with this. Lieutenant, tell me. Yeah. Is that mustache real? Did you steal those drugs? Well, it's not a no. Whiting is told by his feature syndicate, Paige, that three more papers have canceled his strip, Biff Banyan. Hatter bursts into the room, furious, wanting to know how a strip he didn't write ended up in the paper under his name. During this, Paige seems to be playing a character from Steel Magnolias. He's crazier than a longhorn on loco weed. Hatter threatens to quit, and after he leaves, Paige and Whiting start discussing ways to kick Hatter to the curb and have his assistant, Teddy, take over Hatterville. These are the most schemy people I have ever seen. They aren't even trying to act normal. It seems like Demartini isn't the only target in these comics. This guy is also being accused, via Jessica Fox, of some kind of swindle. Jess calls her lawyer over, Russell, to discuss the comics. You happen to know a comic strip called... Family Circus? It's my favorite. I just love it when they do family things. He informs her that she and Hatter are going to be sued for libel and possibly extortion for several million dollars each. Jessica is flabbergasted, as am I. Imagine having a comic strip written about you and then you are sued for it. She's literally done nothing wrong, but Russell is like, well, you're shit out of luck. You could counter sue, but the fees are gonna be insane. Your legal fees can amount to upwards of a quarter of a million dollars. Imagine paying that much in legal fees over this. <coughs> Jess pays a visit to Stan Hatter, who assures her he didn't create those inflammatory comic strips and has no idea how they got into print. She is rightfully concerned that her image is being used to cause chaos. Look, Mrs. Fletcher, I'm your biggest fan. Aw, he goes on to show her more story from his murder mystery inspired comic and shows her his cow character. This is Lorraine. She suffers from MPS, multiple personality syndrome. Oh no, 
But she's not the killer. Wait, the one with the mental illness isn't written as the killer? <laughs> that can't be right. Meanwhile, Demartini is being blackmailed for a quarter mil. He refuses to turn the blackmail letter over to the police for a few reasons, one of which being... My alibi, my former partner, is dead. And I definitely did not kill him. He shows Jess that the letters on the paper are from the Cabot Cove Gazette and accuses her of being the blackmailer. Yes, because Jessica brings local newspapers from Cabot Cove back to her place in New York. You must think I'm some kind of a major idiot. Yes. Jess is mad. Mad, questioning Stan and finding it difficult to believe that anyone but him is responsible. He says he can prove they're a forgery and points out minor artistic choices in the comics. The lettering artist also adds that that isn't his style either. Why would I jeopardize my career? Another couple of years, Haddaville will be as big as Peanuts or Calvin and Hobbes. Sure, Jan. Bootleg Delta Burke wanders over and accuses Jessica of being involved in her own weird way. Have you ever looked a man eating shark in the eye? Okay. This guy, Mr. Melton, proceeds to have a meltdown and keeps threatening to sue Jessica, Stan, and the publisher, but Jess is determined to find the real suspect. She asks Stan if she can think of anyone who may want to cause him harm. That could be a long list. This actress was given this small role and she goes hard, nails every line, no notes. So... this guy is dead? Oh no, the guy we saw for two seconds, the emotional stakes were so high. This is the lettering guy, Ben Watanabe. He went to the studio to do some late night inking, only to find himself getting bonked by a hideous trophy. <laughs> During an interrogation, Mr. Whiting tells Jessica that Stan actually stole Hatterville from him a long time ago, but his Hatterville archives were conveniently all lost in a fire. He also pushes her to sue Stan, which she refuses outright. He tries to reassure her that she is not responsible for the forged comic strips. You have to understand. I'm old as dirt. Mr. Whiting, your uh, credit card wasn't accepted. Ah, thank you. What the hell kind of response is that? Why did he say thank you to his credit card being declined? What a fucking weirdo. Jessica is alerted to Mr. Watanabe's death and rushes to the scene of the crime because, as you know, there is always a famous author on the site of a murder. After two seconds of investigation, Sergeant Redstone determines the death to be a suicide, and I determine that she and Jessica have the same hairstylist. Jess, of course, doesn't buy any of that. Demartini also shows up at the crime scene, and he and the sergeant seem to have bad blood. Janet, what are you doing here? Looking for drugs. Excuse me, sergeant. Would you mind lowering your eyebrow? It's mildly distracting. Jess, being the observant, lovely, intelligent lady she is, points out that the award on the desk could be the murder weapon. She basically schools the sergeant and tries to convince her that this was a murder, not a suicide. While everyone talks, Jess takes a quick look around. It was the plant! <laughs> Sorry, no clue where that idea stemmed from. Because everyone else is incredibly bad at their job, Jess is the one who figures out the murder was likely unpremeditated because murderers generally bring their own weapon, but the award in Stan's apartment had always been there. God, why do all these characters look like members of the GOP? That is scary. Demartini pays Sergeant Redstone a visit, wanting to talk. She is not too thrilled about his presence. You know, there's only one thing worse than a crooked cop. Chafing, just awful. He insists on his innocence and also says that if he could find the creator of the comics, it might lead him in the right direction on the drug case he was on. Redstone is willing to give him a chance if he agrees to watch everything Jessica does. Well, that was a weird cut. Was there something else they did there, or did it really just end on a scene with an abrupt finger point? Ooh, nice lamp. Anyway, the award goes through forensics, and it is determined to be the murder weapon. Suddenly, Jessica has her classic epiphany and makes some calls. First, she pays a visit to Bozell, a journalist who used to work for the tabloids. Demartini accuses him of keeping and archiving libelous information for blackmail, but Bozell says someone stole all of his archives and insists that he did not kill Watanabe. He gives a rather flimsy reason why, but just believes him. I mean, it can't be him. He'd never be able to see in the dark with those blue blockers on. Oh, hi, Basket. Do you wanna, do you wanna tell us about the murder she wrote? No? Get down now, silly kitty cat. They then approach Whiting. He admits that he hired Bozell to spy on Hatter in an attempt to dig up some dirt. He reiterates that Hatter stole his idea for Hatterville and simply wanted revenge, but he also insists that he didn't kill Watanabe. I couldn't do that. Cornball, Bigfoot stuff, if my life depended on it. Cornball, Bigfoot stuff. 
Go on, tell me more about the Cornball Bigfoot stuff. Even though we have basically nothing to go off of, Jess claims she knows who the killer is. They return to the scene of the crime, and Jess somehow remembers that the plant in the office was facing the wrong way, like it was rotated. They look underneath it and find an artist glove soaked in bloodstains. Jess sets up a sting to lure the killer back to the plant. Yeah, it's this guy, Teddy, a character we know absolutely jack shit about. I guess there aren't really any suspects left, so by process of elimination, it has to be this guy. He was being paid by Whiting to sabotage Hatter, and was told he could keep any blackmail money that came in. Somebody put that eyebrow down. I never meant to kill Ben. But God, it felt good. Teddy explains that he was working on forging the comic strips when Watanabe came through the door. He wasn't expecting him so early. Ben had a black belt in karate, and he looked like he was ready to kill. Looked like he was ready to kill? He can't even see, he's in the dark. So he bonked him on the neck and hid the glove under a plant. Jess asks him why he would do all of this, that he could have had a great career in the comics industry. Eight months working as Stan's gopher and I had it up to my skull. Wait, wait a minute, wait, wait. Hold on a second. You only lasted eight months before you decided to blackmail people, then murder someone? It took me 12 years to get this many subscribers on YouTube, and I still get weepy when I see a dead spider on the wall. Jess solves the mystery yet again, and Stan is happy his name is cleared. See you in the funny papers. <laughs> is that a threat? Okay, final thoughts. I had a great time riffing on this episode, but overall, I thought this one was surprisingly dull. The plot hardly makes sense, especially the details of the crime. It's just so bizarre. It almost feels like Death to Smoochie, a dark comedy film about the inner workings and relationships in the kids' programming industry, where people simply despise each other and compete for profitable time slots. But that movie is intentionally bizarre and exaggerated. This episode really tried to create some kind of hostile environment between comics strip writers? And I just couldn't get into it. It's too weird and too unbelievable. We never really get to know any of these characters either. Watanabe's death meant absolutely nothing to me because I had only seen him twice before each time for approximately three seconds. Teddy also barely spoke until the end of the episode where he is smugly confessing. Jess is lovely as usual, but not even her charming self could really save this bland, confusing plot. Harvey Firestein was a joy to watch, but some of the others were just way too campy. And this is Murder, She Wrote. I expect camp, but this Southern woman just sent me with her melodramatic drawl and gestures. I do understand that when you have a show with as many seasons as this one, not every episode is gonna be a winner. That would be statistically unlikely, but I do wish more thought was given to the plot. I wish the emotional stakes were higher. I wish there were funnier moments, and I wish the crime made one lick of sense. The best thing about it is this cute rendition of Angela Lansbury as Jessica Fox and these weird candy machines. Give it a watch if you like these performers or if you just want to watch the entire series to completion. Otherwise, I don't think I would recommend this one. If you have an episode of Murder, She Wrote you are dying to see me cover, please leave a comment in the suggestions. And until next time, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching my video on Murder, She Wrote, The Dead File. If you want more amazing Murder, She Wrote related content, I have more videos to show you. But first I want to thank my beautiful patrons. I recently moved and without their support, I would have not had enough funds to buy rugs. True story, if you want to support me and my rug addiction, consider checking out my campaign. If not, likes and shares support me in a way that makes my soul happy. If you want to see more from me, here's a few suggestions. On the right, I have the last video of that time on Murder, she wrote, featuring computer hacking, and on the left I have a lovely little retrospective on one of the many weird Hellraiser sequels. Be sure to give it a watch. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.